Hi, uh, I'm Art Bergeron. If you haven't seen these presentations before, uh, I'm an elder law attorney at Myrick O'Connell. I do nothing but elder law. I have no clients under 55. My median client age is 74. Um, this is the work that I really love doing. And this actually is a presentation <clears throat> that I really love doing. Uh, I started doing this uh, a few years ago and it is about planning for the last year of your life. Um, because of the nature of my clients, I mean, everybody, we all know that everybody dies, but for my clients, that kind of the, the awareness of death uh, gets greater and greater because we're getting closer to the, to the end of our lives. Um, so the people that I always talk about in my presentations are my friend Frank, friends Frank and Mary uh, and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. You've heard me talk about them many times if you've been to my presentations. Their goal in life, they want to live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. Uh, in this presentation, I'm assuming that Frank and Mary are both about 75 years old. Um, so when Frank and Mary are thinking about death uh, or thinking about the last year of their lives, they're thinking into the future and, say, and, and, and saying, well, you know, I don't know. I could live tomorrow, die tomorrow. I could live for, to be 100. But if you were look, to look at the actuarial tables, what are the chances that they would, um, of how long they would live when they were those ages? Um, Frank's uh, actuarial life expectancy um, would put him uh, dying in, uh, at about age 86. Mary's, act, Mary's actuarial life expectancy would put her dying at about age 87. So it isn't that their, it, their death is imminent, but it's not like forever into the future either. When you get to be 75, I know myself, I'm 71 years old. When you get to be our age, um, um, you kind of think about this stuff more because you know that the, the, it's, it's, it's kind of not, not imminent, but approaching. So of course, Frank, you know, it, Frank right now may actually be living the last year of his life. He could get hit by a truck tomorrow or Mary could fall into the swimming pool. You know, you don't know what's going to happen. I know I, I lost over the past year, I lost um, 15 clients to COVID-19. I bet very few of them at the beginning of that year were expecting that they were going to die this past year, but they did through something that they totally wouldn't have expected. They didn't know that any of this stuff even existed. Um, so you never know. And of course, it's always possible um, that Frank and Mary will just both just go to sleep one night and just not wake up. And if they're Christians, they're hoping that they're going to end up in heaven. And if they're Buddhists, they're hoping that they're going to reincar be reincarnated, hopefully as themselves again, because they liked being with themselves. Um, but the point is, chances are that's not going to happen. Um, if you look at the, the kind of some of the major causes of death um, right now in our country, for example, one of them is certainly cancer, um, and another is Alzheimer's disease. Now, cancer, I know just about. Nobody, no, I know nobody who died of cancer the day after they found out. Um, I know um, uh, very few people who died of cancer even the week after they found out. Typically, if they have cancer, it, it goes on for a while. Uh, Alzheimer's disease, um, is, which many people, according to current surveys, many people fear more than cancer, uh, tends to last a lot longer than cancer does. Uh, it is a, a you know, slow deterioration of your mind and also of your body. Um, there are a number of other diseases that cause dementia, like Parkinson's and others. Um, but in all of those cases, there's a, there's a prolonged period before you die. Um, there's, a, there's a term that doctors often use. Um, it, it isn't on your death certificate as your cause of death, but it's called failure to thrive. And it's that, it's that whole kind of variety of things that happens as you get older and more frail and there's nothing kind of in particular that you that the doctor can pinpoint and say is wrong but you're just not feeling great um, and you're just looking weaker and weaker and that's that's failure to thrive now that typically once again failure to thrive doesn't happen all of a sudden so that really leaves us with heart attack and stroke so heart attack and stroke are the two things that I don't want to say that people pray for, but people think, oh, maybe I'll just die. What they really mean is maybe I'll have a heart attack and die, or maybe I'll have a stroke and die, because that's just going to kill me. Now, 
The strange thing about that, though, is that that kind of is no longer true. When we were growing up, many of us, um, and I'll use 1970 as the year um, of the statistic, but when we, when we were growing up, remember you, you, you'd, you'd know that you'd hear that someone had a heart attack and they just died, or they had a stroke and they just died, and that was common. In 1970, if you had a heart attack or a stroke, your chances of being dead within 14 days uh, were about 33%. Your chances in, in today, if you have a heart attack or a stroke, of being dead within 14 days are about 3%. That's the number that has really changed uh, in our healthcare system because of ambulances and life flights and stents and all these other things. So, so even if you end up dying of a heart attack or a stroke, chances are there is going to be this period of time um, uh, before you die and for a while before you die um, where you're going to be living with this greater level of frailty. So the real um, challenge for Frank and Mary if you're, if you're planning for the last year of your life is how to prepare to be frail. How to prepare to be frail. So. Um, and and, it, and one, of the, one of the nice things about this kind of planning is that you don't have to figure it out like today or tomorrow. You can take your time to try to figure this out. But it is helpful to figure it out so that you're not trying to figure out something at the last minute. So there are a couple of things that you may want to be doing, uh, or actually several things, if you're Frank and Mary, as you're getting older, you know, and you're getting older, so you know, you're not necessarily going to work every day. You've got some time, you've got some spare time. Um, so this isn't a bad place to spend a little bit of your spare time. First of all, kind of get to know the players. Know the players in your neighborhood, know the players in your community that might be of assistance to you if for some reason you started getting frail. Know the home care providers. Now. There are a number of home care provider agencies uh, that, are, that are in our area um, and you can get to know them ahead of time and that's probably a good idea. Um, each of us um, lives in a, an, a geographical area called an Aging Services Access Point area, an ASAP area. Um, for the folks of mine who live uh, in the area around 495, uh, and east, that tends to be, ba that is Bay Path Elder Services. For the folks, and many folks know that I go to Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket a lot. For the folks who are in those areas, it is Elder Services of, of Cape Cod and the Islands. Any of those people could tell you about who the home care providers in, are in your area. And as a matter of fact, people from bo both of those agencies could also talk to you more generally about things that you may want to consider if you're getting frail or if you're worried about getting frail in the future. So that's first. You want to know about kind of who the possible providers are because if you're frail, you may need help at home. You know, the second thing is you want to think about, so if I'm frail, who's going to be there to take care of me in my family? Um, and it may be, if you're Frank and Mary, you're always thinking that you're going to take care of each other. But remember, if you're Frank and Mary, you're the same age. So when Mary is 85, Frank's going to be 85. And so he may not be really great at taking care of Mary at that point. He may want to, but he may not have the capacity to do it. I remember when my, when my mother, um, um, who died back in 1991, when she was getting more frail, my father was trying to take care of her at home. But when she would, when she would fall, you know, could he help her to get up? I mean, it was really, really hard. So, the, the question is, are there, is there anyone else? Now, for many folks, I, I know for myself, we have three wonderful children and we're very close to them, but not physically. I have a daughter in DC, uh, I have a daughter in Austin, Texas, and I have a son in Colorado Springs. They're not gonna be here to take care of me or my wife, um, probably if we get frail. But so are there any folks that are around who can, who can help you out? And, and who are those people? Are there very good friends who you think could be able to help you? You want to kind of be thinking about that thing. So first, there's the people. Um, second, there's the house. If you're Frank and Mary, you want to live in your house until you die, and, and, and even if you're frail. So the question then is, so what are the things that you might need to do in order to fix up your house, right? Is that a ramp? 
Is that uh, uh, improving their stairs? Is it an elevator? Is it making the, the bathroom you know, safer by having grab bars and things? So you may wanna talk to a home repair person about all of those things. And if you don't know that person, you may, you may wanna talk to the folks at the ASAP, at the Aging Services Access Point, who may have those kinds of references. You may wanna figure out how much all that's gonna cost. You may want to figure out where the money's going to come from. And if you're at home, and I think I've, I've talked about this in, uh, in other seminars, if you're at home, you may want to look for kind of in advance for some financing mechanisms for all of that. I have often talked about um, uh, home, home, uh, so-called HELOCs, home equity lines of credit that you can get from your local bank, or reverse mortgages that you can get from reverse mortgage funding sources. So you may want to look at that, not that you want to have, you want to get that money now because you may not need it for a long time, but you may want to know that that money would be available to you if you need to, to, if you need a change. Next, suppose you needed to move out of your house. Well, of course, the last place you want to move is to a nursing home because it isn't designed to provide for social stimulation, to provide for a lot of stuff it's boring in a lot of times being in a nursing home. Um, that's where many folks instead end up really wanting to move to an assisted living community where they can maintain their independence, keep their own apartment, uh, but have some services provided to them um, so that even if they're getting frail, they'll still be able to have a, a better quality of life. So the question is, you know, not where, what it, where, you know, how good is the assisted living in Montpelier, Vermont? The question is, what are the assisted livings around here? Now, in, in there are, there are, you know, in it, it, not on the islands. On the islands, the choices are more limited. Um, but certainly in the in the 495 area, there are a lot of assisted living communities. There are a lot of new ones being built. Um, it may be a good idea to just drive around and go look you know, get a sense of which one you might want to li live in if, if your, your physical situation was changing and it, you decided that you really needed to do something like that, right? Um, similarly, regarding nursing homes, I know that we all dread the possibility of going to a nursing home. But you know, all nursing homes are not the same. For example, I, I often talk about this wonderful nursing home in Nantucket called Our Island Home. This is the best nursing home I've ever been to. Now, if you drove by it, you wouldn't necessarily think that. You know, it's an older building, in the, in the, it, in its, although it's a very lovely location, but it is small and intimate, and the folks there kind of everybody knows everybody. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't fill the usual stereotype of a nursing home that you're going into this big institutional place. Similarly, for folks who are, who are here, here uh, where I live around, along 495, there are nursing homes and then there are nursing homes. There are some that are, that are smaller. There are still some family-owned type nursing homes. Um, there are some that are larger, but, but as a result of really good management, have managed to, to maintain kind of, a, of a, a comfortable feel to them. You know, they can, the places can be very, very good. You want to know about those places ahead of time so that if you have a stroke and you're in the hospital and they're figuring out where, they, where to discharge you, you have a sense that you're going to end up in a place where you might like, right? So you want to know what the hospitals are going to be looking like. You want to know what the assisted livings look like. You want to be able to know how you can maintain your home and then you want to have a team of professionals, and you may already have them, you may want to introduce them to each other, right? That are going to help you make these kinds of decisions if you're in the last year of your life. Now, um, the three that I think you have to have, one is your primary care physician. That's not hard, you have a primary care physician. But you want to make sure that that's the primary care physician that you want to be kind of carrying with you for the rest of your life. If you're uncomfortable with your primary care physician, you may want to shop for somebody whose practice is a geriatric care practice, is an older practice, so that they'll have better sense of kind of what you're going through. Um, an elder law attorney, um, it, it, like doctors, uh, all attorneys 
do not focus their time dealing with, with older folks. And therefore, if you're busy and you're doing a million other things, you may not be as familiar with some of the strategies uh, and programs that are available for older folks. So you may want to really think about an elder law attorney. Finally, there's the geriatric care manager. The who? Usually that's my first question when I say geriatric care manager. The, what, what does that mean? Well, geriatric care managers, um, they're also called aging life care professionals. I've heard, heard that term also. Um, they are folks who typically nurses or uh, um, social workers as, by background who are really interested in dealing with seniors and dealing with the whole variety of issues that seniors face and helping seniors coordinate their care. They're like, they're like specialized care managers um, for seniors. And so they would, would, among other things, their job is to know who are the good home care providers or home care individuals. They may know a number of individuals who are providing home care. Um, what, are the, <clears throat> what are the best agencies? If you're looking for assisted living, what are the ins and outs of assisted livings and what ones do you want to be looking for? Same thing with nursing homes. Um, they may have a better sense of kind of, of, of the way your medicines as a senior are interacting with some of your other medicines. Um, it, many times, you know, in, in many ways, an ideal, ideal geriatric care manager uh, has a nursing background or there's a group where there is a nurse uh, who has that background. So they can be talking to you all the time about how your meds may interact with each other, how all of those, how your, your health needs may change um, as you're getting older. So you want those three players, ideally you want to have them, you want to at least know them ahead of time and you want to see if you can get those three players at some point to have a conversation. I seldom talk to primary care physicians until there's an emergency. That may not make sense. I deal a lot with geriatric care managers um, and the geriatric care managers talk to more, more to primary care physicians because they're often involved with people's ongoing medical care. But the point is that group of people needs to know each other. Also, that group of people needs to know the people that you would be count counting on if you were incapacitated. So I, it would be handy if I knew the daughter or the son or the niece or the nephew who would be working with you if you were incapacitated later on. So you may want to have that team set up. You may you want to know some, what the programs are or you want to know someone who does know about the programs. For example, if you're on Medicare, you know about kind of basic Medicare. What does it cover? It covers going to the hospital. It covers getting out of the hospital and some VNA or visiting nurses coming into your house for a while. It covers your doctor, covers some physical therapy. But you know, if you are homebound and your doctor says that you're homebound, even if you haven't been to the hospital, the doctor can prescribe a, a course of, care, of physical care if you need it, if you need professional care, if you need the care of nurses or OTs, if you need some durable medical equipment like wheelchairs or other things for your home, um, the doctor can prescribe all of that and you can get it in your home, even though you haven't been to the hospital, while the plans themselves um, uh, need to be done in 60-day increments, they are renewable forever. You can be homebound uh, using and getting these kinds of Medicare services forever, right? Um, but you need to talk to your doctor, or you need to talk to your geriatric care manager or to a person from a VNA in order to get those programs available. Then there's hospice. I just had another client who, whose husband had been declining for a, quite a while who um, went to, who said, oh, now we're in hospice. And he was in hospice for like six days. Um, that's kind of a long time. That it, the average amount of time that people spend in hospice, which people typically think of as being a, a residential facility for a person who is about to die. The, the Medicare hospice benefit covers folks as soon as your doctor says that whatever you have in the kind of natural course of things, you may die within six months, then there are a whole set of benefits that you get by virtue of being on hospice and they're all covered by Medicare. There's some home care, there's all that, there's, there's, there's physical therapy, there's nursing care, there, there, are there are counselors, there's a whole package of things 
And like those 60 day plans, they can be renewed indefinitely, indefinitely, right? I've, I've known people who've been on hospice for three years. Um, as long as you've determined that, you're, that, you're, that you're, the, the goal of your care is, is not to get better because you realize that you're kind of in the last year of your life and what you really want is to have a high quality for your life, then hospice, that benefit may be ideal for you. Finally, if you need more home care, and this is especially true in that last year of your life, you're getting frail, you may need a lot of care at home, you may want to try to qualify for something called the Frail Elder Waiver. That is the Mass Health Program. Mass Health is the Massachusetts name for Medicaid. The Mass Health Program that is designed um, to help you stay at home. Uh, if you can show that you, that you are getting frail, that you need assistance with some of the activities of daily living, like just dressing or going to the shower or taking a shower or whatever. Um, or if, you, if, you're, if you're having some cognitive issues or, or your spouse is, then they may qualify for the Frail Elder Waiver. Now the thing about the Frail Elder Waiver um, is that it takes about four months to get approved. So you want to be working on this. If you're living, if you're going through what turns out to be the last year of your life, you don't want to spend four months of it not having the home care you could use because you didn't apply fast enough, right? So you want to know this program, you want to know about it ahead of time, right? There are some asset limits to this program, but if you're Frank and Mary, they're not going to affect you because if one of you is, 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 is um, um, medically in need of the frail elder waiver or need of the home care, that spouse can immediately shift all assets to the other spouse. The other spouse, and the other spouse can actually own the home, no matter what the equity, can have up to about $129,000 in other cash or cash equivalents, and can use a couple of devices to take the rest of the money and turn that other money into an income stream, and the healthy spouse can have infinite income. Now, I just said a whole lot of stuff, and there's no way you're gonna remember all that, and, or, but, and that's not your job. You're, you, what you want to make sure is that there's somebody who does understand that. That's typically your elder law attorney. So, so there are, there are, there are th this is a major program that could really help you, but you need to know about it ahead of time or you need to have somebody who does know about it ahead of time. And by the way, that frail elder, wa wa frail elder waiver program can also pay maybe the home care person that is, even if it's not an agency, who is now providing you with home care Something called, through something called the PCA or the Personal Care Attendant Program. So once again, you want to know about these programs or know who does. Finally, you want to make sure that there's somebody who is implementing all of this with you. Because if you're in the last year of your life, you may be feeling terrific, but maybe not. You know, I mean, we've all gone through this. People, you know, who are, were, are you know, in great shape for all of their lives, but as you start um, diminishing during that last year. If you're frail, you may not be wanting to handle all that stuff. And if you're Frank and Mary, and, and you're Frank and you're getting frail, Mary not, may not be up for it either. She just wants to be kind of helping you go to the bathroom, you know, and get around the house. She doesn't want to be worrying about this stuff. So there are some things you have to have in place. You have to have a power of attorney. Have to have a power of attorney. Um, the power of attorney gives somebody it doesn't make, it doesn't, you don't lose any power here, but you're giving somebody else the ability, uh, in addition to you, to handle your legal affairs, to go to the bank, to deal with your, to deal with the, 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 uh, the, um, the, the assisted livings, to deal with all this stuff, right? So you want to have a power of attorney. You want to have a healthcare proxy. The healthcare proxy is going to kick in only when the doctor says that you can't make a medical decision anymore, and at that point the proxy is going to kick in. You probably want to have a, a HIPAA, HIPAA forms figured out, a HIPAA designation, so that any of your kids can talk to the doctors, can talk to the nurses, etc. Finally, you want to have a MOLST form. The power of attorney um, for the last year of your life, maybe you want it to be, if you're Frank, maybe you want it to be Mary, but maybe you also want to designate somebody else. You can name more than one person at a time, so that if Mary's not up for it, one of your kids can take care of it. You want to make sure the power of attorney has some specific powers in there so that if, for example, you want to be restructuring assets so you can qualify for the frail elder waiver, you can quickly do that. Um, you want a health care proxy. Once again, do you want Mary to be that person if you're Frank? Um, you, so you want to have a backup in case she's kind of really not up for it, right? Um, and, and 
And you want to make sure, in a, in a, and you need to remember regarding healthcare proxies that you can only have one at a time. So if you want to name all your kids as proxies, you can't. You need to pick a child, and, and if that person isn't available, name somebody else. Because if I'm the doctor, well, I don't want to be dealing with a whole bunch of different people. HIPAA designations. While you can only name one proxy at a time, you can authorize all of your children, for example, um, to get your medical records or talk to your doctor. And that way, all of them can feel comfortable, even if some of them are far away, that they know what's going on. And finally, in the last year of your life, you may want to do a MOLST form, Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. That's a document that would be signed by you and your doctor that would say, if you become, if you have, a, if, you know, if you're on the floor and you're having a problem, that you're not going, they don't, you don't want to be brought to the hospital. You want to be staying at home, maybe because you want to die at home. Or if you've, your heart is stopped, you don't want them to try starting it because you're in the last year of your life and so maybe it's just time to die. You know? But these, once again, these are all your decisions and you have the right to make them. Finally, um, you want to have a conversation with some of these people, with, with the person you've named as your healthcare proxy, the person you've named on your power of attorney, regarding how you do want to be treated during that last year of your life because you may not be during that last year capable of making those decisions you may be too sick so you want to be having those conversations with the people you've named to help you out you may also want to be writing them down in case there's any so there won't be any argument among people um, so there are a number of things that you want to take care of to plan for the last year of your life the most important thing to know is that it, the, the, because of the fact that you're probably going to live for quite, it's quite some time before you die, you have plenty of time to plan it. That's the good news, right? So if you're smart, take care of all these things. I guarantee it'll help you sleep better at night. If you've got any other questions, um, you can always watch this presentation again on uh, our YouTube channel, on Frank and Mary's YouTube channel, Elder Law Frank and Mary. Thank you very much.